is Hannah. Thanks very much for coming. Although I know uh, it's, it might not be your own decision to come here. You might just follow people around you. <laughs> this is a joke. Uh, my point is, uh, people are influenced, people's behavior are influenced by other people in the same group. So this influence, this kind of influence, it turns as peer effect in social science, which is a topic of my presentation today. So I'm going to talk about peer effect in the division of uh, in the division of innovations, uh, theory and simulation. Um, and uh, first, uh, so peer effect, uh, um, as as we've seen just now, it's uh, widely exists and uh, have been studied for a long time. But um, uh, it seems to uh, have very well studied on. Uh, about how the significant mechanisms, the peer effect uh, occur in the social system. So in this uh, present study, I'm interested you to explore three questions. First, what are the significant mechanisms through which the peer effect influence the uh, division in the region? And the second one is, how can these mechanisms be models uh, in the structure of social network? And the third one is, what uh, interesting result can found from these models? Um, uh, so here's some uh, key uh, concepts in this in, 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 in this study. First one is the peer effect, which is defined uh, by a Maskin in his seminal work in 1993. The propensity of an individual to behave in some way uh, varies with the preference of the behavior in the same preference, uh, same preference group. So. Um, uh, as, as I mentioned now, just now, as, uh, we are trying to explore the basic the specific mechanisms how these peer effects uh, occur in the, in the social group. We basically propose three uh, mechanisms. One is an individual can be uh, informed by his by, by his peers and then and then take the same action, and uh, and it can he, he can also be uh, uh, advanced by his peers or be caused by his peers. I already explained this in a minute. Um, and also innovation. So innovation is the uh, refers to whatever an uh, idea, practice, or objective that that is perceived as new by the by the individual. So in this particular uh, study, the innovation we're looking at is a new uh, high crop, uh, high value crop, and we look at how this new crop diffused in the uh, in central China. So here I just uh, give you some uh, ideas about this um, new crop, value, uh, new value crop. It's called Artemisia's Lengthies, which is a very uh, difficult to pronounce. So I, I just, um, this is how it grow in the, in the field. And then we, we, we harvest the, the like, stalk of this vegetable. Um, and this is a very popular vegetable in central China. And, and in, in uh, expensive one. And yes. When the stone gets uh, old and mature, we use it as seed stock for reproduction. So just uh, some basic information about the innovation. And uh, then this is the this is the village we look at. It's called the Golden Road Village, and in the center of China, it consists of ten groups. Actually, the ten groups are natural groups, uh, natural villages. The Golden Road Village is. Uh, it's an uh, administrative village. And these are some basic statistics uh, of this village. It contains 463 households. And the largest group in the, uh, in the village consists of 67 households. The smallest consists of uh, 90 households. So uh, this this is how we uh, conducted the, the, the survey. And this graph, this graph basically shows how what happened in the past uh, 15, uh, 15 years in this village. And uh, so the new crop, the um, Anita's language was introduced into this village in the year of 2001. And before that, in 2002, uh, the, the, the pure income per capita in this village was 670, which is just uh, about a quarter of the average level in the country. So that was very, uh, it was very, very poor at that time. Uh, as, 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 my, uh, as, as my data is the poorest in the county, and the government, uh, the uh, administrative uh, village government even can't, uh, couldn't afford the agriculture tax at that time. 
So, but when they introduce the, the new crop, so they they start to become uh, the, the the income uh, start to increase, and then here this year, the last year, so they have um, the the pure income per capita becomes um, uh, about twelve thousand, which is uh, like forty uh, twenty times than uh, ten times higher than um, fifteen years ago. So they are higher than the national. The solid line, the solid red line is the is the, is the uh, uh, you know, it's the pure pure income per capita in this village, and the, and the Dutch red line is the is the uh, pure income per capita in the country, and the the blue line shows the number of adopters, uh, number of households who adopted the new crop. So. This uh, the adoption, the division of the new crop uh, has has um, significant impact on the social and the um, social and economic uh, situation of this uh, village. And uh, so uh, I'm going to track how this new crop develop in this in this uh, village and uh, uh, and. Uh, and Summarize the different types of peer effects. Uh, so the first one is this. Uh, the um, first question we would like to ask is how how did the household know the new crop uh, at the beginning? So the, the the answer is they knew this from their peer region uh, leaders. So this new crop was introduced in the region uh, on 20th of May 2001. So uh, at that time, the village leaders wanted to promote this uh, new growth. So they sent each of the households a, a, a bundle of uh, seed stocks. In, uh, this action informed all the households about the new, uh, uh, new growth. And in the first year, it ended up with 17 households adopted the new growth. Um, so these, the, the first known lead, uh, known lead adopters uh, decided to adopt this new crop purely because of the basic information about the information get from their peers. So we call this kind of influence as uh, as in, uh, information effect. So this is the effect that they are informed by their peers. And uh, uh, so information effect here re refers to the influence of uh, uh, the transmission of information about the innovation from their peers. This gives some examples of the uh, information effects. And uh, when the, as the uh, division proceeds in 2002, and a little more uh, household adopted a new crop, and they enjoyed the high market price. So in 2002, a lot more households wanted to join. <coughs> the problem. They need to have the uh, they, they don't have sufficient uh, seed stocks. Now, um, now the, the seed stocks come from when you uh, when the when the when the uh, the product gets uh, get old. So they when it's fresh, they sell into markets. They can earn money. So they don't want to uh, make uh, um, make uh, older and and and, um, and uh, refer to as the. Uh, seed stock, so they can only the households can only get uh, uh, the seed, seed stocks from their close relatives. So here, the uh, peer effects happened again. Uh, we call this um, this influence as experience influence because they can the households are um, uh, are advanced uh, by their peers. <coughs> so. Um, <coughs> Peer effects will refer to the influence of sharing the uh, close, close adoption cost and the benefit information on materials uh, from their peers. And uh, in the division of a, a grade in another village in the same province, Professor Xu also finds some uh, also find the similar information of sharing the, uh, the planting skills from their peers. And also in Norway, uh, the, uh, there's a study about the participation of the 
mortality uh, leave program, they also find the information, uh, they also find the effect of sharing the cause and benefit information. So, uh, uh, and uh, the diffusion kept going on, and in 2006, uh, group two, which is the uh, group that uh, progress most, they uh, at that time most of the household in group two have already adopted the new crop, and then they did the thing. They changed the whole irrigation system in this group. You know, in the, in the village, each of the groups had their own irrigation system, so they changed this in order to uh, satisfy the requirement of producing the new crop. Uh, here notes that the new crop, the uh, planting the new crop requires different amounts of water compared to the traditional crops. The, the uh, rice paddy and the cotton are the uh, uh, traditional crops in this region. So they change the system. Once the changes, uh, and in 2008, all the groups, all the other groups also changed the system. And, uh, and even changed the, uh, the layout of the land plots in order to satisfy the planting of the new crop. So, uh, when the, system, the irrigation system and the layout of land plants changed, those who didn't want to uh, adopt have to adopt now because they, uh, because they, all the others have changed this. So the lagged household were coerced to adopt. So this effect is, um, is the is, uh, we call this kind of effect as an externality effect because the, the peers create the externality to cause you to uh, change your decision. So, uh, mm, they are, they, uh, but the, you know, the externality effect can be positive or negative. So, you can, uh, so in this case, this is uh, uh, the, so the peers peer, uh, create a negative externality and uh, uh, push the uh, the non-adopters to adopt, which increase the uh, diffusion. So this effect we call the uh, next, uh, positive net attention effect. Um, and also uh, we find similar effect on other um, uh, in, in other cases. And uh, especially uh, uh, Bandy and his co his colleagues find the uh, positive externality in the diffusion of microfinance in the village in. In, in, in Indian, so they uh, they find that when they for, uh, when the when they are, uh, the households uh, don't need to adopt the microfinance as most of his uh, labors have already uh, adopted the microfinance because they can just earn money from their from their labors. So this is an example. Of of uh, negative externality effect. So basically, these are three uh, specific mechanisms we propose for the uh, peer effect. And uh, in, uh, and we also make uh, compare make comparison between the three types of peer effects. So we just uh, uh, we end up with this um, diagram, which shows that different types of peer effects occur at different stage of the diffusion process. Um, information in fact occurs at the beginning of the process and then uh, experience in fact occurs at the early stage, accident in fact occurs at the later stage of the diffusion process. Um, now we try to uh, we try to uh, analyze this by um, empirical data. So um, when we try to do this, the first problem we have we, we uh, encounter is how to identify the peer effect. So this actually has been a problem for a long time. Maskin in, in, in his sample paper have identified different uh, uh, have uh, so termed this problem as a reflecting problem. So he uh, identified different uh, three types of uh, identify identification problem, and uh, uh, he pointed out that identify, identification of peer effect is impossible unless researcher has um, prior information specifying the composition of the reference group. And also, he 
uh, suggests that an uh, experiment data will be the will, will, will have to play an important role in future studies. And uh, so, uh, inspired by by this argument, there were a lot of attempts to uh, structure the reference group as a social networks. So here are some uh, some stamps here, and they uh, show that we can uh, it helps identify the peer effect if we structure the pref uh, preference group as social networks, and they also develop some simulation model to achieve this. So in our study, uh, is for us it's even more challenging because we not only want to identify peer effect from other effects. Well, we also want to identify uh, or distinguish different types of peer effects. So in order to, uh, to achieve this, we have to make two assumptions. The first one is that we assume, uh, uh, we assume peer effects do exist and play a role in the diffusion process. So this is actually the, uh, the assumption all the simulation models have to make because unless you simply exist, you can model it, you can simulate it. The second one, uh, the second assumption is we made in this, uh, specifically made for this, for our study. We assume that the different types of peer effects <coughs> occur through different types of type of, of uh, social net, uh, social relationships. So, in our particular case, uh, according to our th uh, the theoretical analysis and our um, observation from the real world, we find that the information, we assume that information in fact occurs through both kinship ties and uh, geographic ties in the, in the, in the ability. And uh, uh, experience in fact occurs through kinship ties. As that in fact occurs through uh, geographic ties. I will come back to the different ties in a minute. Um, <coughs> So uh, then we uh, talk about the data. So the data is always uh, challenging. As uh, you already mentioned just now, so we, uh, in, we need the individual data. It's, it's really challenging for simulation study. And for this particular, for, for, the, for the study of peer effect in the peer, in the innovation, uh, in the division of innovation, this is even a uh, bigger challenge uh, as Valence, who is an expert in this area, have uh, uh, talked uh, just a few months ago that data has been a major problem in, in a study of this area. And uh, our research has been limited by it for a long time. So uh, I uh, basically summarized the data we required for conducting the, this study into three types. The first, we need to have the network data, which shows who connects who, which individual connects which individual and uh, use this data as explanatory, explanatory variables. The second type is the diffusion data, which shows uh, how an idea or practice diffused in a social group. And the second one is uh, we also need some domestic data, which shows the social and uh, socio-economic aspect of individuals. So we, we have to have all these three types of data in the particular, in the, uh, in the same uh, so uh, social system, as as Valent has argued, now we only have three types of data, so three data uh, three data sites um, uh, so far. So uh, luckily, we collect some we collect all this data from the golden rules of validity. We get very high quality network data, and we also get uh, good enough division data and the demographic data. So for this present study, we only use the uh, network data collected from this village to, to calibrate our simulation model. Basically, we have three types of uh, the network data of three types of uh, relationships. So according to our knowledge, you know, the, the uh, decision making of the household uh, are profound affected by three types of ties. The first one is the kinship ties, so um, the kinship relationship. The other, the second one is the house neighborhood relationship, and third one is the land broad labor 
and the neighborhood's relationship. So, um, and here we thank the two, um, the two projects from the National, from National Natural Science Foundation of China to support our data collection in this region. And uh, uh, now let's just look at the data we have. So first one is the kinship uh, uh, relationship data. Uh, the kinship relationship consists of blood relationship and uh, marriage relationship. We get so for the blood relationship, we get the uh, family trees of all the clans in this village. There are about uh, there are sixty five clans in the village. Some of them are just one family clans. The largest clans consist of fifty six households. So we have the family tree. Each of the clans connects all the households in this village. And then we transform, we translate the family trees into adjacent matrix, which is a typical way of storing network data. And uh, uh, we also uh, sign the ties to uh, a weight to each of the ties. The, map, the algorithm we use to calculate the, the, the weight of ties, which is the, the exactly the same way of calculate the degree of sensibility. In, in this uh, the act that we developed consists inconsistent with uh, is consistent with the, the canon law of uh, Catholic Church. I don't know whether if you know, know this, but it's very um, by by chance we just uh, have the same algorithm and then and we are developing the software to, to to do this. So here I just for you uh, show you some pictures and this is a, a family tree I guess from from a family. Uh, when I did the survey in this in this religion, so I just uh, uh, try to uh, just include all the households in this family tree. And for some of the uh, big families, they uh, big clans, they have a book to um, you know for records all the relationships. Then I can just use this information. And uh, uh, by having uh, and having this information, I code them into the family trees like this. And then I use the software we developed. To uh, use to calculate the uh, the relation the kinship weights to translate these uh, family trees into adjacent matrices. And for the uh, for the re, for the marriage uh, relationships, we find we record all the match. We, we think we uh, almost all the relationship uh, marriage relationship. From the year 1915 to 2000, in within this village, for example, in the in the village, uh, in, in this group, they have uh, we we record uh, 13 intermarriage in this group. So before marriage, before the intermarriage, we will only look at the marriage uh, the blood relationship network. It will be like this. So then, if we consider intermarriage, it becomes something like this. So most of the families are connected, and these small families are also connected. So this, uh, you can find the marriage have a profound influence on the network uh, structure in this in, in the in the groups. And these are the kinship the kinship relationship data, uh, data. and uh, and then we also have the household neighborhoods data. So. The way we uh, record and calculate, we use Google Earth and, uh, and uh, ArcGIS. So I just uh, quickly show you how the uh, so this is a, a Google map, a Google Earth map we used to uh, record the the, the 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 data. So we um, so. Yeah, very quickly. The these are the, the this this is the village. So main is and uh, okay. So this is the whole village. And uh, so uh, the groups are uh, the groups are located along the village. Uh, the, VG road, which is this road, this is the major road, VG. And here is group one, and group two, and three, four, five.
5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. So this is 8, 9, 10. Um, and uh, in order to uh, record the location of the of the houses, so we uh, label all the houses in this uh, in, in this video. So these are the house these are houses. So we just uh, we just add a landmark on to, to indicate the householder. And then we have we have all this and then we translate the Google Earth data into um, coordinations. Here we thank uh, Jin in the School of Sociology, uh, in the School of Geography, uh, Geography helped me to translate the Google Earth data into uh, coordination data. And then I translated the coordination data into adjacent matrices. And here, if you, um, and here we also record all the data, all the land plot data. So these are the land plots. So the number indicates the, the uh, indicates the number of the group. So here, so these are the land, and these are the, the household, the owner of the land. But when we uh, create the adjacent matrix for the land plot neighborhood, we don't use this. We, we record this for another purpose. But uh, we, because we have another document which is even more accurate for us to create the adjacent matrix, which is the land contract. So each of the household signed land contract with the uh, village, and we have all the land contract uh, of the of all the households. So in this land contract, for example, in this one, uh, this household has five land plots, and here the is the acreage of the of the uh, of each of the land plot, and uh, especially here, these are the four directions: this east, west, south, and north. So they uh, here we call the labors of the land plot from the four directions. We can use this as as our as the data to create the adjacency matrices. So um, basically, these are the uh, network data we get from this region. I think these data are first of all quite reliable, and also all the data, all the all the uh, ties are weighted. Are weighted. So um, uh, this network data, we use this data to uh, calibrate the the simulation model we built. So in this study, we structure the natural the social the social group. In uh, in search networks, so uh, basically we use a two-layer multiplex network to indicate the the, um, the social structure of these groups. So we uh, simulate the net the kinship network as a, a word strokes small words uh, network. Um, the the reason we simulate is we calculate the uh, small word list and all other you know, network topology metrics, we find uh, this, the kinship network in the VG uh, match the small, uh, small world network very well. We have another paper about this network structure in rural China. We, can, uh, we, have, the, we have the result there. And also we uh, simulate the geographical network, which here is the uh, land plot neighborhood network as uh, as adult random, random network. So uh, here we have the network structure of our simulation environment. And then these are the behavior rules of the household. They basically have two ways to, um, to indicate their adoption uh, state. Uh, basically there are two ways to simulate the uh, adoption behavior. As uh, Yogi mentioned just now, one of, one of the ways to uh, set up a threshold. I call it a threshold um, approach. Another way is to simulate it as a probability. I call it the probability um, a approach. Here I use both. I, I, I use the approach, the, the uh, uh, probability approach in simulating the ex experience effect. And I use the externality uh, uh, threshold approach to uh, simulate the externality effect. So, I, I won't go through the details, just to show you that there are two um, behavior rules for the household. And uh, 
um, categories all the parameters based on the data we, can, we collected from the VDD. And the result, the first result gets the, <coughs> the diffusion curve. So the diffusion curve uh, in the scenario of low C vitality, we get a very typical S shape. Uh, S shaped the diffusion curve. This is uh, uh, the like the most uh, the previous studies have got. So uh, which which also indicate that our simulation successfully replicates the, uh, uh, the diffusion. What's, what's on the horizontal axis? So this is the uh, these are how, how many rounds? Oh. So the, the rounds. So and the, the uh, vertical uh, axis is adoption rate. So uh, and uh, this is result for the uh, negative activity effect. Remember, in our system, we simulated both uh, uh, we, uh, both active uh, negative activity effect and the positive activity effect. And uh, in previous study, people only consider the positive effect. They don't. They 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 can they ignore the negative effect. So here, when we conclude, when we include the negative extending effect, we find something like this. We find the fluctuating uh, diffusion curve, which indicate that uh, this there are two uh, effects competing with each other in the system. So I think this is a, uh, this is even more common than S shaped diffusion curve in the real life. Because for most of the innovations, it's not, it, it doesn't end up with everybody adopting it. So, uh, this is a, a result we find here. N uh, another um, thing we're interested in is how different types of pure effect affect the effectiveness of the diffusion. So, here we run, the, on, run this regression. Uh, so, um, basically, we use the adoption rate. Uh, uh, related to the matrix as the, um, as the response variable here. And we run, we really interested in the uh, experience coefficient and the extended co uh, threshold, which indicates the, the strength of experience effect and the uh, activity effect, respectively. And these are the control variables. And uh, this is our result. So basically, just look at here the uh, Extensity, uh, experience coefficient and extensity threshold. So uh, all these are significant, but this is not a surprise because this is a sample regression with simulation data. And uh, what we um, want to emphasize is the trend of the change. It's the trend of the um, of the of the uh, of the coefficient. So here you can find that experience ex uh, experience effect. So uh, the the like the the influence of experience effect decrease as the diffusion proceeds, and the the, the uh, influence of extending effect increase as it produced as the um, diffusion process proceeds. So we can so here we can basically uh, suggest that this. Uh, so at the early stage of the diffusion, extended effect plays a more important role, and later on, uh, extend, uh, sorry, at the beginning of the diffusion, uh, experience effect plays more important role, and later on, extended effect matters more. And also, uh, we interested in so uh, if we don't separate uh, separate different types of effects. Just as the most of the previous studies did, so they take all the they take they don't uh, distinguish different types of ties, thus uh, different types of pure effects. They take them as a whole. Then they, we run two regressions here to see uh, the difference. So here we find uh, we uh, we find a, a situation that uh, each of the separate effect is significant in statistics. However, when we put them together, the integrated effect is insignificant. We call this situation as inconsist inconsistent situation. We find this situation when we uh, run this uh, when we run the regression. So 
in this case, uh, we find, so if we separate this as two different types of ties, uh, two different uh, effects, we find both, of, both uh, the two effects are significant. So I find, so both of them are significant when we treat them separately. But if we, if we uh, make them together and treat them as an integrated, uh, net, uh, integrated uh, effect, it becomes not significant, which means so if we don't classify uh, them into uh, if we don't look them in detail, so we are find uh, we, we we won't won't find the uh, experience uh, peer effect. So actually, uh, in the work published in Science in two thousand and three, they treat the peer effect. As a whole, and they find it insignificant. So, uh, and in the in 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 their work, they uh, they indicate that there are different types of uh, influence. And some of them are some of them positive, and some of them negative. Uh, so, it might be it might be the case if they treat them separately, you will find both of them significant. So, we run this uh, do this experiment a few times, and we find the well, we can summarize the conditions while the the in consistent situation is frankly observed. So it's basically observed. So first of all, when we have negative extended effect. So if you have a negative extended effect and the experience effect is defined as positive, then we have both positive and negative effect. There's a chance they can offset each other. Then when they offset we can we we are find the uh, integrated effect is not significant, and also nine of them sh uh, should be very strong. If one of them is very strong, when they integrate, you put them together, you will find some uh, the integrated effect will be will, will be strong. But you, the the sign of the integrated effect will depend on depend on the the effect which are stronger. In, in, a magnitude, and if and the third condition is that two of the two effects should be close, so you look close to each other, so they cancel each other out a lot, so the integrated effect will be very very little, so uh, it end up with it's not significant in statistics in statistics, and also we are interested in how the network properties affect the the, the effect of this. Different types of effects. So we, uh, the way we uh, identify this, we run the regression with interaction terms. So here we select uh, three uh, metrics to measure the network property: average degree measures the connectivity, uh, classical coefficient measures the, uh, measures the, uh, the transitivity, and the average impedance measures the distance between uh, nodes. And uh, we. Uh, Time them uh, with experience effect and uh, extent effect respectively, and uh, put them into the regression. We find something here, something like this. So first of all, they all they are all uh, significant, which means we do find the interaction effect between the network structure and the different type and the different types of peer effect and. Uh, uh, so uh, this is in the scenario of negative extent effect, and uh, now we come to the conclusions. Uh, so the first uh, first one is uh, we uh, uh, make so a systematic classification of peer effect is made according to different types of uh, social interactions. So um, and uh, also in this uh, classification. Uh, the network, the negative peer effect, are introduced into the into these kinds of analysis for the first time, and also we propose a simulation model to incorporate different types of peer effects in the multiplex network. And, uh, by running this model, we find a few uh, interesting conclusions. The first one is the interplay between positive and negative effect can create fluctuating. Curve. 
so with a difference from the original uh, S shaped degree curve. And also, the, we, we also find the uh, experience effect has higher impact on the division process at the early stage, and the externality effect matters more later on. Um, we, uh, by doing the experiments, it also pointed out that if we ignore the specific uh, peer effect, this can lead to biased conclusions. And uh, uh, the stronger connectivity, higher transactivity, and shorter distance uh, helps strengthen each of the peer effects. So these are the conclusions. Thank you for listening. Time lines, we've got some time for questions. Questions, anybody? Uh, rush, <laughs> I, I have one question. Uh, okay, so, um, question, yes. so take purpose, but I have one question for, for me, a little, just a little one. Then. Sure, could be fine. Okay. Yeah. Sure. yeah, I'm sorry about that. So yeah, that's fine. Just go ahead. Because there was no time before to ask. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm interested about the Asian based uh, mod modules to migration studies, because mm -hmm. one of the problems nowadays is it's uh, the circular migration. So you don't know where the migrants they are going, mm -hmm. their decisions, so it's, it's hard to track them. And you said that by using a, a Asian based models, you can track individuals. Yeah. And do you think that we can apply that to migration? To, uh, to yeah, well, um, uh, yes, uh, we can of course track uh, each individual, but uh, mm -hmm. We track the simulated individual in the model, yeah. right? So we uh, we cannot track like a real individual. Mm. But what we can do is uh, we can actually, um, you know, uh, use similar logic that people were using to recreate um, uh, uh, ancient uh, uh, settlements when they say, okay, you know, when when people. Uh, get to a s certain area, and they need certain resources like you know water, food, shelter, or not. And so they would create an agent-based model to see uh, how people would settle down uh, uh, and what, what will be the settlement uh, sizes. And so there, there have been a number of papers, very, very famous papers, that studied uh, how um, uh, Indians were s settling around the rivers, and then when they compare the results with archaeological sites, they would see quite uh, uh, quite a lot of correspondence. So the, 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 there have been, you know, ways to, to deal with that. So so what I'm thinking about we can do is figure out, you know, when when immigrants come to to, to a new country, and you know I've I've been through that myself. <laughs> Uh, the very first thing, you, you know, the, the, there are a number of things that you're looking for. Uh, so certain characteristics of place where, where you're supposed to live. And that's where you can uh, settle down. So, so when you have these uh, rules, then you can say, okay, if we know the flux of immigrants, and, and you can get flux of immigrants, you know, from, from the border control, right, because they, they were, you can... Uh, estimate you can model where, where people settle, sure. and so you you can track each simulated individual, of course. Okay. I think you guys probably need to talk for a little bit. Yeah, yeah. So, um, Jorgi, I think you had a question, and yeah. there's at least two or three other people. So maybe Jorgi, you can... yeah, yeah, just just had just kind of a quick question. When you're talking about statistical significance, but we're going to uh, uh, talk about uh, talk more about that. Mm -hmm. So. Uh, how you design the test? So what? Um, so how did you calculate the statistic? So we just used the simulation data to do the regression. So then we selected uh, the data to indicate the first the the, um, the, re the explain the uh, three variable we interested in. Mm -hmm. Also, we put a bunch of uh, control variables into regression. Mm -hmm. yeah, it's just wrong question. So, so, so my question with that is, um, when um, when you run the simulation, so, so when you calculate the p-value or you calculate, you know, uh, uh, standard error, anyway, mm -hmm. the, the the square root of m is in the denominator, right? So I'm just wondering, 
what was that value of n? Was it related to the number of simulations uh, you had, or you know, like? It's related to in this um, in uh, Georgia we didn't uh, uh, indicate this very clearly, but for some uh, for the regression for the um, uh, here the regression for for this uh, uh, for the period factor with the, uh, the impact on the diffusion, we use the, uh, the, the observation, we use the kind of aggregate state, aggregate level data, we, which we um, uh, use the diffusion, uh, the adoption rates mm -hmm. as the response variable. Mm -hmm. So by the diffusion rate, we have to finish the, the uh, uh, one simulation. So we calculate, we run this, um, we have uh, 60, uh, uh, 3,600 combinations of the parameters mm -hmm. and then we run them 100 times then we get six, uh, so we get three, uh, 306,000 uh, data we use this data to, uh, to run this to do yeah, the compression we can, uh, we'll need to talk about that because I just need to check to make sure that you know when, when you have the, the square root of n in the denominator, that n is not the number of simulation runs. Because it's not simulation runs. For this for okay. this particular regression, it's the it's the finished runs. We get the because we have to get the regression. We get the diffusion data. We cannot get the uh, adoption rates, so we have to finish the round. Right. But for this particular one, we uh, focus on the individual level. This one, we we focus on the individual level. So these are the rounds for the for, for so we take each household as uh, each household the decision of a top or not mm -hmm. as the uh, response variable. Mm -hmm. So uh, if we look at here, so Z here is the is a binary variable. So it indicates the house of position, the adopt as one, is not adopt as zero. So, so this regression runs at the household level, so the observation, the number of observations will get different. Here we lose some, uh, we lose five. Yeah, yeah I guess that, that, that's where I have a concern, because since this is a simulated model, right, so you can, uh, uh, for example, if you run it 10 million times, and that 10 million goes to denominator, your p-values will, will, will get smaller because your confidence intervals will get tighter. So, oh, so, yeah. so that, 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 that's the wrong thing to do. Yeah. And also you can also say, oh, okay, I have 500 households, but let me run 5 million households, and then uh, again everything will become significant. So, so, so we'll need to, to, uh, 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 you know, just, to, just to make sure that this is not the case. Okay. Sorry, sir. Um, I'm just wondering um, the use of um, agent-based models, just like the use of the other decision support systems in simulating or optimizing natural resource management use. Mm -hmm. yeah. So, can you use the agent-based models to um, predict futures for alternative futures for um, stakeholders' demands within um, forest landscapes? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah uh, you can do that. But again, as you know, uh, remember uh, I had those diagrams of sources of uncertainty. So yes, uh, the reason why I think agent-based models are, are very useful is that, in some ways, they they provide you the best way to predict, because you know, as as we know, nobody can predict future, right? The only thing you can predict, there, there are things you, you can predict. I, I bet you that in five years, July will be much warmer than January, right? So I, <laughs> I can bet on that, right? But when it comes to behavior, when, when it comes to economics, when it comes to, 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 to other things, it, it becomes very difficult. So what people do, and, uh, um, and in many ways, um, you know, when, when the process is very complex, you will either make some very simple linear projections, right, or use some statistical model, say, hey, you know, look at this trend, things were going up, so we project that <laughs> they will keep going up, and, and that will be our guess. Uh, but when we build agent-based models, we can start looking at 
what are the possible ways of using the resources, uh, how people could, uh, you know, could move, what will be their locations, what will be their actions. And so when you put all these informations in the model, uh, very often the model becomes quite big that you cannot comprehend it in, the, uh, 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 in your head. But, but computers have no problem. They, they can run simulations and you can look at the statistics. So, so they become essentially the best prediction you can make. I mean, of course, nobody can, can know the truth, <laughs> but, but this will be the best prediction. Yeah, I have a question. Uh, you explain what is it? Uh, so here we assume that the experience factor happens through the Kinship uh, network. So experience factor is defined as positive. So you get experience, you have higher, you, you, uh, if like you, the portion of your adopting relatives is higher, so you have high probability to adopt. There's no post, uh, there's no negative in the kinship network. But the kinship network only happens on the geographical network. You have uh, either uh, positive accidental effect or negative accidental effect. So this is why the negative effect comes. Thanks. And one small comment about this Google app. First of all, it's really interesting, okay. but I, I think it will be more interesting if all the levels are in English. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so because I, I love it in Chinese because when I collect the data in the village, sometimes I need to show this to them yeah. to ask them to 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 verify if this correct or not. So, <laughs> so it's it's really time consuming. And, you know, it, I I I didn't uh, you know have time to to uh, to show you the English version uh, Google of that. So maybe it's maybe over time I do that for for maybe for a reason. Yeah, in one of your earlier slides with your actual data, there was a decline in the last few years in the in the number of people using the new crop. So it, it went up initially, but then the last can you show oh, that's it? Three, uh, it was a uh, decline a little bit, yeah, that's true. So um, here, that's why we, we we said we don't have very high quality diffusion data, because we only we have the data on which households adopt, but we don't have the data of the Exactly the acreage that plants the yeah. uh, the the new crop. So here some of the households access because mainly because the uh, old households died and their uh, their children didn't uh, their children get job in the cities. Yeah. So but but the land but the land plot they have is not is still plants uh, the new crop. Some some other guys is left in the village. That's what intrigued me because you have the income continues to go up, even though yeah. the number of adopters. So are you uh, are you seeing the generation of super families or, or rich versus poor that you have fewer doing it but they are richer? Oh yeah, that's kind of the trend in China you know, because of the urbanization started. You know, high uh, rapid urbanization started. The, in early in the 21st century. So a lot of households moved, immigrated to the cities, yeah. and the, then the, left, the household left in the village, they kind of manage larger uh, acreage of land. So it bigger for it. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, just a small question. Uh, you said that the families have like a, a family tree uh, book. See, how, how far they go to the past? How far they can trace the Oh, for some of the large families, like Li, which is uh, probably uh, some people know is like the, it's the family name, it's the largest family in the world. They can trace even to, you know, thousand years ago, like uh, we have a, 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 in Tang Dynasty, the empire uh, 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 family name is Li, so they can, tra they can track back to that time. So, uh, very interesting. Very, very. <laughs> Yeah. About agent based modeling, um, it, in a lot of networks you get super nodes, um, mm -hmm. like HIV infection and contacts there. Does the agent based models converge? Do, do, do they generate super nodes? Uh, oh, uh, 
it depends. It depends on how uh, how you develop it. And actually, there have been some some really interesting models that uh, uh, would describe exactly exactly that. Like for example, uh, there was a famous paper by um, Potterud and uh, Jim Moody. So when they looked at sexual networks for adults and sexual networks for uh, teenagers, and what they would show is that in adults uh, you would have like super spreaders. So m most people are in monogamous relationships or so don't have partners, whatever. But there are a few people who will have many sex partners. So when infection gets into this population, you just get a very quick boom, you know, just like, like a, 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 an explosion, a quick epidemic. But then, if you think of teenagers, teenagers have uh, high, uh, uh, high moral standards, so they only have like one boyfriend or girlfriend, but they break up very easily. So like, you know, every month or few months, you can have like a new boyfriend and new girlfriend. So this becomes uh, uh, what's called like a serial uh, uh, monogamy. And so if disease gets into this population, it starts spreading very slowly but it keeps running for a long time and infects, much, infects many more people than uh, 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 what, uh, what you can observe you know, like in, uh, in adult sexual ne network. But yes, you can, you can absolutely you know, right to follow, follow, rules follow some rules. Yes, yeah, yeah, you can establish some rules and you can see formation of these network. Yeah. And actually, uh, uh, yeah, there, there, there are some, some well-known uh, uh, models that uh, you know, for uh, team formation, for um, you know, uh, developing sexual partnerships, for um, you know, uh, finding buddies, for for, for doing some work. So, so, so yeah. Okay, I think that was uh, that was a long but interesting set of uh, uh, long present set of long seminar and an interesting set of presentations. And I just would like everybody to say thank you to our two speakers again. Thank you.